the humble 2x2. Affordable, discreet, and until now, largely unviable. Unlike similar survival games, Conan Exiles requires regular long-term access to a huge variety of crafting stations that demand an unreasonable amount of space. But this is no ordinary 2x2. What you're looking at is nothing short of the finest in Conan Exiles rat engineering, the ultimate in compact base design. There's no trick here in scale. It's not hanging off of a cliff and it isn't built over a hole. It's a standard 2x2, one wall high. The only difference is how the space is used. Let's take a look. This base contains an improved tannery, an alchemy bench, an artisan table, an improved furnace, a preservation box, a grinder, a tanner's table, an improved armor's bench, an improved blacksmith's bench, an improved fireball cauldron, a campfire for cooking, an improved carpenter's bench, another improved fireball cauldron, and plenty of light while also boasting an impressive 12 chests, all easily accessed for storage. And yes, before you ask, you can spawn at the bedroll without getting stuck. It is, in every way, a fully usable base packed into a very tiny cube. Not a single square inch of space is wasted. A lot of care was put into making sure the process is easy to replicate, despite how complicated it may look. And while I use Terranian building pieces to make it look nice, this base requires no DLC, no mods, and no exploits. Just a bit of patience and some game knowledge. But this video isn't just a 2x2 tutorial. We're going to cover a lot of different building tricks and techniques that you can use to maximize the space in your own base. The 2x2 is just the extreme example we use to illustrate how things work. But this little cube is also intimately related to the creation of this channel. The answer to an age-old patch, and the result of a petty grudge that I've held for years. It's about time that I got to enjoy the fact that I was right. Fair warning, if you're just here for the build tips, check the timeline and skip ahead. For the rest of you, I've got to get something off my chest. Settle in while I tell you a story. It all started three years ago, with the addition of what's known as the economy update. My channel wouldn't exist if not for this update. Not because it was good, but because I hated it. The very first video I made was an hour and a half long video attempting to communicate why I thought the update and the changes it brought were bad in excruciating detail. If you're wondering where that video is now, it's gone because I used nothing but copyrighted music in the background for it, thinking that eh, I'm never going to do this whole YouTube thing anyway, so who gives a shit? Funny how things work out. But the most fucked up thing about it is that I mentioned it in my Discord and it was so long ago that most people don't even remember how things used to be. But Kronk remembers. Like it was yesterday. Let me set the stage for you. Crafting in Conan Exiles pre-economy update was very different to what it is now. The highest tier bench you had access to were the improved stations and they didn't have any effect on craft speed or item cost. Instead, the thralls used to handle that. For example, a named alchemist would cut the cost of crafting alchemy items in half while also speeding up the crafting time. Costs would round down too, so you only needed tier 2 thralls to cut the cost of things like steel fire in half. There were also fewer benches, and each bench did more. The armor's bench used to be where you could stretch hides, craft armor materials like layered silk, and create armor enhancements like bulk armor plating and armor reduction kits. You know, everything related to armor. The blacksmith's bench used to be able to make toolkits for your tools and weapons. Stuff like efficiency toolkits or spiked weapon fittings. And it was also where you could make coins and other jewelry, while flasks would be cooked directly in the furnace. The fireball cauldron handled everything alchemy. So aloe potions, dyes, war paints, and wraps were all made at the same bench. And don't get me wrong, the old system wasn't perfect and the time that it took to get thralls made getting set up on a fresh server a little cumbersome. But it was a system that made sense. Benches did what you'd expect them to do. And if you wanted to gain power, you had to go out and conquer the wastes. Nothing made you feel like you were playing Conan Exiles more than running through camps and bonking NPCs over the head to make them craft bombs for you, returning to your base full of thralls and feeling like you were making real progress. Because crafting efficiency was tied to thralls and not the kind of bench that you had, everybody got to play the game like normal people, no matter how large their base was. But then everything changed when the economy update attacked. Ruining it! You're ruining my lips! You're ruining it! Ruining! The economy update changed a lot, but the two big things it did was move crafting power away from thralls and onto benches, while adding roughly 17 new benches. So benches now handle crafting costs and speed, which poses a problem. What would you say the thralls do here anymore? Sure, some would still increase craft speeds. I could go to an NPC camp, build a wheelhouse, find the thrall I need hopefully at a high enough tier, knock them unconscious, wait for them to break on the wheel, and transport them home for a moderate increase in speeds depending on the tier, or... I could just build another bench. Which option makes more sense? 
Keep in mind that benches you're using to produce things like reinforcements and steel fire in bulk only cost iron and bricks, both easily mass produced in the early game with very little effort. And the speed bonuses from thralls aren't even consistent. Let's say you want to speed up crafting at an artisan table. Adding a thrall should help, right? Well, I don't know, maybe. Are you using a tanner? Then yeah, blacksmith, no, carpenter, no, smelter, yes, for some reason, but armorers, certainly not. That's five kinds of thralls you can assign, and three of them produce literally no benefit with no way to know unless you test it. But this also begs another question. For benches that don't have improved varieties like the artisan table or the tanner's bench, how do you reduce the cost of things like hardened leather or layered silk? That's the neat thing. You don't. Curiously, the tanner's table does have an improved variant now, but it just doesn't reduce cost, unlike every other improved bench in the game. These days you can make oil with alchemists, but that used to be a special recipe on specific thralls. Moving it onto all tier 3 and 4 alchemists was done long after the fact, to mitigate the fact that you could no longer reduce the cost of those items or produce oil as easily. But even the thralls that were supposed to bring new benefits were often indecipherable without wiki assistance. Seneschals, builders, tempersmiths, bowmakers, and fletchers? There wasn't really any way to know what any of that meant in terms of bonuses, and looking it up would pose some… interesting questions. Questions like, what's the point of a low-level blacksmith? The benefits they give are so small, most of us thought that they were actually bugged on release. A 2% increase in relative armor penetration? Look at your average spear. 8-9% to armor pen, and that's on a high-level spear. What's 2% of 9%? I'll answer that question. It's not enough to make a difference. A low percent increase damage on a weapon? I mean, we're talking about a few points of damage depending on the weapon, and if it's anything less than the top tier, you won't notice it at all. I mean, sure, it is technically an improvement in that you can measure a difference, but would you feel excited to obtain duplicate tier 3 blacksmiths like before? I'd be willing to bet not. Or for an even better example, look at carpenters. If you don't use bows, you really don't need a carpenter at all anymore. I guess tier 3s and 4s can turn branches into wood, if that's something you wanted. But you can see how almost entire thrall categories and most lower tiers are suddenly a lot less valuable after 2.1. Meanwhile, name thralls, the rarest and most valuable of the thralls, are split into multiple categories, so finding the one you need is even harder than before. Even if you find a named blacksmith, now there's a chance it isn't the kind of named blacksmith that you need. It's all made especially weirder when you consider the stated goal of these changes. The community post that accompanied the patch said this, Previously, crafting power was heavily reliant on having specific tier 4 crafting thralls, which would not only make it frustrating in case you didn't find the specific thrall you needed, but also made other lesser artisans feel less relevant. Ignoring the fact that you didn't need a tier 4 to cut your cost considerably, but you're telling me that getting the thralls you needed was too difficult and too many thralls felt pointless, and the solution was to make getting the thralls you need even harder while making even more thralls feel pointless. An interesting choice. Now obviously I'm being a little dishonest. They specified that obtaining crafting power from thralls was the problem specifically, and moving that to the benches was supposed to fix that problem. <sighs> so we should probably talk about those benches. This is what the economy update is most known for. Adding brand new tier 3 benches and spreading the functionality of old benches into a variety of new ones, such as the alchemy bench or the tanner's table. We're going to talk about the bench variety first, because as you probably guessed already, the size of these benches is the entire reason we're talking about this patch in the first place. One of the economy update's stated goals was to reduce recipe bloat, and to its credit, many recipes were improved and simplified and some objectively good changes were implemented. Stone consolidant used to cost ichor, for example, and the bonus armor types from armors would clog up the crafting area. But in other cases, the bloat was handled by sweeping it under the rug. If they moved the recipes to another bench, then they were out of sight and out of mind as long as you ignore how huge these are. Let's be real though, how many people even have space for these? Who can comfortably fit a dying bench into their base? What about a tinker's table? Does that fit nicely into any base? The analogy of sweeping them under the rug becomes doubly accurate since many people, myself included, have opted to unceremoniously drop these benches onto the lawn in the brief moments where we need them before putting them back into a chest where they remain for 99% of the playthrough. And we'll come back to how weird that is later, but the takeaway is that even if you mitigate the size requirements of some of those benches by hiding them when not in use, you still needed more benches to do what you used to do with less. Benches you'd have to leave to cook for a while, like the alchemy table or the tanner's table, would have to fit in somewhere, which all means a larger base footprint. But really, those benches are the least of your worries. 
If you really wanted to maintain your old crafting power, it's the new tier 3 benches that you have to worry about, which are even larger and more confusing. Now see, Funcom made the interesting choice of attempting horizontal progression with these. Instead of either one being a strict upgrade to their prior tiers, each kind would specialize in either reducing crafting costs or increasing crafting speeds. The problem, of course, being that there's no real use case scenario for benches that make you farm twice as much. The 30 minutes you save in crafting time at an armor's bench doesn't make up for the two hours you'll spend farming the extra materials. So paradoxically, the speed benches cost you more time in the long run. And I think most people have figured that out by now. Outside of purely decorative purposes, how many people are building the trade alchemist bench? Or the giant's fireball cauldron? How about a campaign armor's bench or a trade carpenter's bench? I'd be willing to bet it's not a lot and the few that do quickly convert after a few farming trips and figuring out the problem. Why spend twice as much time farming if I can just build two benches or wait a little longer? Even if I only have one bench, I can just craft while I'm offline or out exploring. The only speed benches people use are the precision tannery and the heat efficient furnace, and that's for very simple reasons. Firstly, they're not crafting expensive items, they're smelting things, so their cost-effective variants only save on fuel costs. And neither bark nor coal are scarce resources. But it's also because these benches process things in bulk. It's one thing to wait on a single set of gear to craft, but when you're smelting 40,000 iron or tanning 30,000 hides, you're saving potentially days worth of crafting time at the cost of a little bit of easily obtained fuel. It's kind of a no-brainer. We're gonna ignore the fact that the naming conventions here are weird too. I mean, precision for most benches indicates that it saves on cost, but the precision tannery is actually the faster one, while the efficient one is... plant-based? Don't they both use bark? Trees are plants, right? Never mind the campaign, garrison, trade, giants, and other prefixes. I mean, if you're trading potions, surely you'd want to reduce cost for profit, right? Nope, that's the speed bench. Campaign blacksmith? Well, arguably you'd have less access to resources on a campaign, so you'd want to save on cost, right? Maybe the garrison one can afford to be a bit more wasteful since it's at an established place, or... Nope, campaign is the speed bench. Heat efficient furnace? Surely that one saves on fuel, right, if it's using its heat efficiently. Nope, it's the speed furnace. At least for that one, the other furnace is literally called fuel efficient furnace, so it should be pretty obvious which is which. But much like with the thrall changes, figuring out what certain benches actually do can be really difficult without a wiki, and that wasn't the problem before. But the biggest problem is the fact that all of these new benches are, with few exceptions, absolutely enormous. And unlike a lot of changes that affect PvP in a roundabout or unintentional way, when asked to explain why the benches are so large or how they came up with the crafting speeds and efficiencies, PvP balance was given as one of the primary reasons. This quote is slightly edited and paraphrased for length, but this was the response. What we wanted to address was the economy of space. Space is a valuable resource in the Exiled Lands and survival games in general. How big you're gonna make your base, how big you're gonna make your build, and how that's gonna, on PvP servers maybe, reveal your base to other people. And that's a decision we want to be in your heads too as you're going through and choosing which things to make. So if you're making the tier 2 bench, it's going to be the most efficient for your space footprint. If you really want to have a small secluded area, then you can have the tier 2 bench, it just has slightly less bonuses. I think about this comment a lot. Not even in a malicious way, but it's as if I had just been abducted. Or encountered something so alien, so bizarre, that wrapping my feeble earth mind around it would shatter my psyche into a million pieces. I need to structure this carefully or else it's going to be an 8 hour video. Firstly, the idea of balancing around space, especially in Conan Exiles, is silly. Never mind that space isn't actually a scarce resource if you're not playing PvP, but if you compare a larger base to a smaller base, the smaller base has to sacrifice on what benches and how many benches it has, while being impossible to defend in a raid in exchange for being cheaper and harder to find. While the larger one is more expensive to build in Honeycomb, but can have as many benches as you can afford, while also having the benefit of being defensible in a raid. In other words, there's already a natural spatial economy here. Both bases have trade-offs that make them appealing to different groups of people. People that opted for smaller bases were already making sacrifices to make that possible and avoid being found. Keep in mind, every player in the game has a built-in radar system thanks to the land claim system, so staying hidden was never a guarantee of safety. Additionally, meta locations give you all the benefits of a large base without any of the drawbacks since most of the protection comes from in-game structures. Places like the Keyhole, for example, were extremely easy to build while offering plenty of space. Balancing around space when locations like that exist is craziness. At the risk of sounding a little masturbatory, I'm going to quote myself from the video I made three years ago. The new system is redundant because the only locations that are affected by the new spatial economy are the same locations that were already affected by the old spatial economy. You're not making a new system, you're just compounding an old one. Now if I live in an ultra sneaky tiny base, 
Not only do I sacrifice on the number of benches I can fit, or even the kinds of benches I can fit, but now the benches I can fit are magically less effective and no amount of thrall capturing can fix that. Well said, me. It wasn't just me, though. Most people immediately figured that if the new spatial economy was only going to impact tiny bases, then it was effectively just a nerf to solos and small clans, wasn't it? In fact, while certain parts of the community were excited for new benches, nearly all of my complaints were fairly common at the time. To get some examples, I dug around some videos uploaded around the time of the update to show you what I mean. It's comical how easy a seasoned clan of 10 players can dunk on a new 2-3 clan starter on a server. Features like the one they produce by making bases bigger and stand out more, on maps like Sipta, it's effectively making that Zerg role much easier. So in other words, the power gap between alpha clans and small clans is widened. Awesome. Sarcasm. As a generally solo PvP player, I feel so fucked. Does a tier 3 carpenter's bench really need a whole fucking tree to get the idea that it's a better bench across? This takes the fluff out of the crafting system. Yeah, you just need 3 times more thralls and 15 more benches. Or look at this one. I'm honestly trying to figure out what major purpose the tier 1 to 3 thralls serve, and the only clear thing I could tell was maybe unlocking a specialty on the bench. I had a laugh at the cost reduction versus fuel burn time. Like what? Seriously? Are they that out of touch with the game? Or this one sums it up great. Because you really want to pay double to make weapons and armor faster. Said no one ever. But my favorite comment string I found is this one. The way they are doing this is going to give big clans an advantage over everyone else. That will always be the case. Be couchy, a big clan will always a big advantage. Survive. Conquer. Dominate. Right, that's what I'm saying though. They already have an advantage, so the developers shouldn't be giving them more of an advantage, they should balance the game. And I'm in a huge clan, we rotate members to keep our numbers up, but we run over anybody. There is no challenge, don't make it easier for us. No, because supporting a clan, etc. is something different. If you don't do that, you have nothing. If you have a MMO, Huerty, you can do everything on your own, even PvP, it's a bad thing. But, lowercase, I agree on balatching things, period. That's true, period. But still, period. A big clan should always get, double space, the control. That's how world PvP works, and how things work. Things, Dag. Things. Things. Well, you shouldn't believe everything you hear, Thornton. If you have more people, equals win. That creates conflicts and players' wars. This is the caliber of your average economy update enjoyer. At least we both agree that the game should be belatched. But especially now in 2023, I don't really have to dwell on any of these points in particular because time has already proven us all right. Did the attempt at balancing around space result in new considerations in a spatial economy that's healthy and enjoyable for all players? No, the meta spots just became more meta while a huge amount of previously viable base locations for solos and small groups were dropped completely. Did the new benches result in greater variety and choice in the endgame? No. Outside of decoration, half the tier 3 benches are never used, and the redundant benches you don't always need are kept in a box so most people just pretend they don't exist. Did moving crafting power onto benches remove the apparent frustration of thrall hunting? No, because in order to match your old crafting power you still need a thrall for the speed bonus, if speed is even an option since the tier 3 efficient benches are weirdly slower than their improved versions. And if all you're doing is improving your gear, thrall hunting is more annoying than ever. You still need a tier 4 armor to get the best bonuses on your armor, but you need the right kinds of armors and blacksmiths to make the best gear. It's all the frustration of specific thrall hunting with the increased material cost and size of the new benches. It's the worst of both worlds. Never mind how weird it is to say that it was too frustrating to obtain crafting power before, only to release benches so large it effectively boxes entire groups of players out of crafting power entirely if they don't commit to building suicidally large bases for their clan size. Did they succeed in making sure thralls stayed valuable? Well, not really. For me and a lot of other players, it's not uncommon to skip thralls entirely for shorter playthroughs. After all, if it's a solo versus 12 people and hackers like my last playthrough, which went well by the way, the playlist is on my channel, thanks. Even a large difference from a named blacksmith won't really matter in that case. Thralling is objectively less important for a Conan playthrough than before. Many thralls feel less valuable, and most people opt to just build more benches. Did the patch reduce recipe bloat? Yeah, that's the one thing it did really well, only to then replace it with bench bloat from adding 70 new benches that don't fit inside a normal base. And while I don't think that Funcom was trying to make life miserable for solos and small groups, it certainly felt that way at the time. For context, this was the same year that horses were added, so people were dying in a single hit without even seeing their opponents render in. The farming perks were made more expensive, which made you even more vulnerable if you were farming alone since you couldn't afford vitality or strength or anything. 
And since solos and small groups obviously didn't have the manpower for bodyguards, while large clans had the extra bodies to go on ganking sprees, it was just another indirect nerf to small groups. The gathering rates had been cut in half. You couldn't get good thralls on Sipta without summoning surges, so you just get ganked there too and lose out. Greater Sabretooths were killing players in a single hit, and after the economy update, solos had to choose between farming extra to make the same things, or building a base that would get them killed. It felt like someone woke up one day and said, what if we made it exponentially harder for solos and small clans for literally no reason? Refused to elaborate, and then never touched on it ever again. But then they actually fucking did it. And I've been seething about it ever since. The end. On the bright side, you don't get to play the game like a normal person, but you do get to sit on your porch at 3am and stare at your tinker's bench like a glassy-eyed fish person, waiting for your toolkits to craft before banishing it back to the Shadow Realm. If you've ever felt that it was weird that you had to do that at all, you're not alone. Just know, dear exiles, it wasn't always this way. There was once a time where you could craft your toolkits in the same bench that made tools. An age undreamed of, where armor supplies were made in the armor's bench, where a thrall was always a good addition to your base, and small groups weren't penalized for literally no reason. That was over three years ago, though, and while many of those problems haven't been directly addressed, they're a lot easier to handle these days. Still, there's always going to be a part of me that is annoyed at how much more effort solos and small groups have to put in to stay viable when they're already at a disadvantage. Every time I stash my loot, move between bases, extend chest decay timers, and craft out of comedically sized sandstone cubes before desperately rotating my loot around raid windows, I remember the economy update and muttered to myself like a grumpy old man. But now that we're done with that remarkably long and maladjusted tangent, it's time we got into what you came here for. The information you need to take back the space that was stolen from you all those years ago. Firstly, simple honeycombing and doors. Believe it or not, this first technique was actually really old. This was the meta before we all learned how to fence stack years ago. Place a square of fence foundations with a wedge foundation inside, close to the ground. The order is important, since you can't put any fence foundations down if there are walls adjacent or below it. So build up the fence foundations first, and then place your ceiling tiles. Follow it up with the walls afterwards. This gives you an insane amount of health per square inch, at the cost of using a lot of building pieces, which is something that you should watch out for in officials. But if placing specific pieces in a particular order and needing to tear down entire wall sections for repairs sounds like cancer, that's because it is. So here are two simpler methods that are also effective. Firstly, a subscriber of mine named Darkshine reached out to me to show me something interesting. For the longest time, it was assumed that damage would always leak through wall or fence foundations to the foundation behind it. As it turns out, that's not always the case. Nemedian, Arena, and Dungeon foundations won't be damaged if the wall or fence foundations are facing inwards, while Yamatai, Terranian, Kitan, Argosian, Aquilonian, Stable, Insulated Wood, Stone Brick, and Pyramid foundations won't take damage through walls no matter what. The running theory here is that for foundations that always take damage through walls, like Black Ice, it's possible that the little pokey bits they have on them stick through the walls and fence foundations just enough to take damage even when they should be blocked. So if you're looking for the easiest honeycombing possible, two rows of fence foundations plugged with one of the square foundations listed earlier. If you're looking for something with a bit more health but just as simple, just swap out the square foundations for wedges facing outwards. Explosive damage won't leak through the wedge foundations, so each layer is handled separately. This gives you plenty of health without all the complicated stacking and still cuts down on the building pieces compared to the primary method. I know it may seem counterintuitive to use simpler stacking methods that give less health, but you have to remember that, especially on 4x, it's possible for a solo player to farm hundreds of bonds in the span of an hour or two, and a clan considerably more so. I mean, we're talking literally hundreds and hundreds of bombs in a couple of hours. You're never going to be able to out honeycomb bomb production. And in the one in a million chance where you get raided while online, which I'm going to tell you ahead of time is very rare, you want your honeycombing to be simple and easy to replace. After a certain point, the extra health just becomes pointless, especially since they're just going to go through doors anyways, which brings us to the next bit, compact door tunnels. This is going to be the same thought process as the first stacking method. The only difference is instead of walls, we're using door frames. If you're having trouble placing a door, just open the doors behind it since they can sometimes block each other and try to keep the same orientation. This results in almost as many doors as the old school fence stacking method, at the cost of being a lot more annoying to get through. It's up to you how annoying you want your base to be. Use at your discretion. Now I'd like to show you something that I'm quite proud of. I showed this off in a prior stream. I call it the poor man's vault. It's basically two chests worth of storage with quite a bit of health added. As you know, I'm fond of my rat's nest base designs, but affording those vaults can be annoying and they're not exactly space efficient. The poor man's vault seeks to remedy that by lowering the cost of steel by almost two thirds at the cost of some insulated wood and black ice, which are comparatively way easier to farm in bulk. 
making a final product that is much more affordable and can fit basically anywhere. Start by making two squares with fence foundations. Place wedge foundations facing outwards from the middle on both sides. Build up your fence foundations, then place your ceilings. On the inside, place walls around the wedge foundation, then stack some chests against where the window will be. Then place the windows. Place a pillar on the wedge face in the door, the final window frame, and the door frame, followed by two caps on top. Just make sure the door opens away from the chest and you're golden. For those of you curious, the pillar is there to block explosive arrows so they can't just pop the chest and grab the loot bag. This forces them to bomb through the entire structure. All combined, it's a minimum of 165,000 health if they blow through the ceiling and the chest and more if they go through the walls. Quite a bit of health and you can fit these just about anywhere, so feel free to experiment. But now it's time to get into the real greasy stuff. Don't worry if it's not immediately obvious how some of this is useful, the 2x2 uses almost every method here, so when we get to that part, you'll see real world examples of where and how these techniques are used. We'll start with the easy stuff. Foundation offsetting is extremely simple. Either place a fence foundation adjacent to a regular foundation, which allows you to lower it, or place a wall on a foundation and snap a foundation to the wall. Both of these methods will offset your foundation by a set, reliable amount, and different offsets will allow you to do things that you couldn't otherwise. For example, offsetting a foundation upwards with a wall is about the same height offset as a chest, and chests can be used to provide support for benches, giving you functional flooring. Lowering the interior floor of your base gives you more vertical space without increasing costs. Costs rise exponentially when increasing the size of your core, so eating into your foundations is basically free real estate as long as you plan around it. Additionally, a lot of the larger benches can fit into a space with two upward offsets without having to commit to another wall, for example, a precision fireball cauldron will fit into this one high area because we've dipped into the foundations a little bit. Remember, this is basically just a foundation level and one wall, as opposed to a foundation level and two walls if built normally. If you're building in a tight space, like inside many trees or areas with slopes, slight offsets will overcome the changes in altitude without wasting as much space. Wedge ceilings go hand in hand with everything else here. There's no trick to learn here, they just have really forgiving collision. In areas where you would not be able to place a ceiling tile, you can often get away with putting wedges down. In my jungle playthrough, my farming shack used wedges a lot to give me extra space on the second floor. And the same basic idea applies to door frames. These have almost no collision at all, and you can place them at all kinds of places. Because you can put the door frames into most benches, you can also give yourself support for a second floor without using walls that would otherwise restrict the placement on the lower floors. In caves or awkward base locations, offsetting some foundations, placing wedges, and using door frames for support gives you an incredible opportunity to maximize the amount of space that regular building can't. But that was all of the basic stuff. Those tips alone will let you double your floor space with some practice, but bench stacking is where all of the real gains are. No matter how much space you free up in your home, if you're not placing your benches effectively, you're just wasting your time. But bench stacking is easier said than done. Notice how this cup is nowhere near the carpenter's bench, but it's somehow interfering with the placement. But once the bench is placed, I can put all kinds of stuff on and around it. For another example, you can't place this blacksmith's bench here, but if you place the blacksmith first, then you can follow it up with the carpenter's bench. Effective placement is a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You want to get the outsides done first and build in. As long as the obstruction is on the outside of the bench, it will work. But most of you already know that. Bench stacking is a bit different. It involves literally stacking benches onto each other. And doing that means that you have to know what parts of what benches give support. Many benches such as alchemy tables have little books and decorative objects that have full collision. While other benches have collision that is nothing short of baffling. Generally speaking, the improved armor's bench, the dismantling bench, and the artisan table have the most forgiving hitboxes. And the rule of thumb is that if you can place a chest, you can probably place a bench. With practice, you'll start to see some opportunities. Artisan's tables can be placed directly on top of Tanner's tables, for example. Alchemy tables can also be put on Tanner's tables, and dismantling benches can be placed on just about anything. But here's a freakier example for you. I'll explain how that works later. Improved furnaces have that weird lip on them where you can place things like chests, refrigerators, crafting stations, whatever you need. 
and the top of the furnace is a slope that can also be used for storage. Even with just this information, a lot of usable space has potential. Maybe you stack an artisan bench over here and free up space for that bench over there, but even all of that is small time and has been known for a very long time. Once you learn the real secret to bench stacking, you'll be surprised what you can get away with. You'll notice in my Tower of Benches demonstration that we have a few chests wedged in here or there. Like I said earlier, chests can give support to benches and items can be placed on top of them. A well-placed chest can increase the usable surface area or allow you to bypass the little decorative items that have collision while still using the bench for support. But believe it or not, even in my video from three years ago, you can see offset foundations, benches on top of each other, chests for floors. All of this is actually really old school solo tech. It was a recent breakthrough that encouraged me to make this video. Rewind a few months. I did an impromptu live stream sharing some of what I had figured out, and the best I had made by that point was a 3x3, which was small. But I don't want my base to be small. I need it to be tiny. Itsy bitsy. Some might even say, teeny weeny. So the chat and I spent some time working on the 2x2. And you can see it's not nearly as well done as the final product, and at the time I was almost convinced that it would be impossible. But something pivotal happened here. I was attempting to stagger some chests using bowls when a subscriber suggested I use incense. I actually hadn't used incense for building up to this point, and even at that moment it was being woefully misused. As you can see, I was using it the old fashioned way, trying to create a surface that I could use to place objects. But if I wanted to use this for bigger benches, I'd be using tons of incense, but making a tiny base that requires hundreds of placeables kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? But soon, I would learn the errors of my ways. I didn't need more support, I needed less. Basically, while messing around with incense burners, I accidentally reverse engineered the placement system. If you've ever tried to place a crafting station on a set of foundations with even just the tiniest little bit hanging off, it'll tell you, not enough contact with ground. And yet, weirdly, when you go to place the same bench on open ground, it'll often let you place it with significant portions of the bench floating in the air. Why is it so lenient when placing on the ground while being so strict on flat foundations? It's actually not strict at all. We've just been misunderstanding it this whole time. Mind you, this is all theory on my part, but here's what I think is happening. The system is checking for two things before it lets you place a bench. Firstly, the bench needs to be making physical contact in a specific area on the bench. For most, it's right in the middle at the core. After satisfying that condition, it checks for sufficient ground near the base of the bench. But that ground doesn't actually have to be touching the bench. Because it has to account for placing benches on weird lumpy ground, it averages any ground in that is close enough. We can prove this by offsetting some foundations and placing the blacksmith again. Even though the offset foundations are technically not touching the bench, the system is averaging it in anyways because it's close enough and the core of the bench is making direct contact. And so, for other benches that have very small requirements for hard contact, it's enough for them to be on something as tiny as an incense burner, as long as there is good enough flooring underneath it. This is also why you can't place a bench on a pillar, despite it having a larger surface area. If there isn't enough perceivable ground beneath it, to pass both parts of the check. This means that if you know which parts of the bench require hard contact, and you know how much variable support it requires, then you could really put benches just about anywhere. The furnace we placed earlier, for example. On a regular ceiling tile, it doesn't pass the first check because this bench needs contact all the way down the middle before it starts to look for sufficient floor. So while being placed on a carpenter's bench doesn't have nearly as much real support, it passes that first check and averages the stuff around it to say, if it's good down the middle and there's enough stuff nearby, then give it the go ahead. The incense burner is important for not only helping me understand the system, but it's also a way of offsetting a bench placement while keeping it close enough to the ground to be placed. And that can be used in all kinds of creative ways. For example, in the early versions of the 2x2, placing a tanner's bench opposite the carpenter's bench was impossible. This was because the carpenter's bench has a little box on the side that has hard collision and collides with the tannery. Originally, I was bypassing this by creating a surface of chests and placing it there, but that wasted so much vertical space. By contrast, the incense burner lifts it just enough to no longer collide with the carpenter, while still allowing for multiple benches to be stacked on top without having to increase the height of the structure. If you've noticed, the final 2x2 not only has more benches than the prototypes, it's actually smaller too, only requiring one offset for the walls instead of two. But we've gone over a lot, and this is admittedly a little confusing. If we put it into practice, all of this will make more sense. Which means it's finally time.
I promise, it's easier than you think. First, place four foundations as close to the ground as possible. Then use a standard wall offset to raise a set of fence foundations around it, then finish the shell. This slight offset will give us literally just enough space to place our benches without colliding with the ceiling, without making the 2x2 look any taller. So from here, you're gonna have to make sure that your placement is extremely tight. Here's a pro tip. Over encumber yourself and don't spec into encumbrance. This way you can move slower and have more precision. First, the improved blacksmith. As close to the far corner as possible, followed by the improved carpenter's bench. Place an improved fireball cauldron in the middle space of the carpenter's bench and make sure it's oriented so that the flat side is facing you and push it to the back of the bench. Then place your improved furnace on top. You're gonna have to lower it one tick so it makes enough contact. Next, the tannery. Look at the center line between your two foundations and build five incense burners from the wall just to the right of it. Technically, you only need the fourth incense in this row since that's what the tannery is technically resting on, but this makes sure that the measurement is reliable and placement is easy. Place the tanner as far to the right and as close to the wall as you can. Once it's down, delete that fifth incense burner or it's going to bump into things later. At this point, you can optionally place a lantern in the corner and to the left of the furnace. The fireball cauldrons will give plenty of light on their own and there will be a space for a standing torch later. I just prefer lamps, but if you're worried about your placement, feel free to skip them. Place another improved fireball cauldron between the tannery and the blacksmith's bench, with the flat side facing the door. Place a regular preservation box on the lip of the improved furnace. You can technically fit an improved preservation box here, but it pokes through the ceiling and people can interact with it from the outside, so that's why we're using the smaller version. Place your improved armor's bench inside the blacksmith's bench like this, and try to keep it as parallel with the left wall as you can. Next, place an incense burner near the middle of the armor's bench, and then a few around the corner of the armor's bench on the fireball cauldron. We're going to trick the system into thinking that there's a floor here so that we can place the tanner's table on top of the armor's bench. The placement here is the least forgiving, since you have to angle it to not collide with the preservation box, but also keep it as perpendicular to the tannery as possible so it won't collide with future benches. This one is the biggest pain in the entire base, so don't feel bad if you have to take some stuff down and try again. Once that's placed, put a chest on it like so, and delete the incense burners on the fireball cauldron. It goes without saying, but be super careful when you delete things in here. If you wind up deleting a bench on accident, you're probably going to have to start over. Now we're going to place our first row of chests. Place one chest on the flat side of each fireball cauldron like so. In the small gap of the tannery, put two iron bowls on opposite sides, and then place two chests on top. These have to be raised up so that we can fit the bedroll in later. Now look at the back of the tannery and place your alchemy bench. Keep it parallel with the tannery. The chests underneath are giving it a partial false floor, but the actual point of contact is the side ridge of the tannery, so try to focus it on there and pull it forward, keeping it as close to the wall as possible. Stack four iron bowls on the anvil of the blacksmith's bench behind the alchemy table. We're creating another false floor here for the artisan table. Angle the plate so that the final one is resting just off to the side of the bench. Then place a chest like this for more support. Face the front of the artisan table to the back of the alchemy bench, and it should place easily on top. Once it's placed, you can delete the plates behind, and then delete the chest that you placed. Place your campfire under the alchemy table, as close to the fireball as you can get it. Make sure you rotate it around a little to make sure that it's as close as it can be. Then make a tower of plates off the carpenter's bench. We're creating another false floor here with the top of the tanner's bench so that we have support for our grinder. Put three chests against the outer wall next to your door. You can place the door whenever, by the way, just make sure that it opens towards the boxes. When the base is all said and done, you can open and close the door by either interacting with the hinge or clicking above the chest. But once those three are down, set up another row of chests next to it. You're going to want to angle these just a little bit, not even just for the support, but because it's going to give you a little gap that you can use to interact with one of the chests underneath. Since once those three are placed, you're going to want another chest right on top of that in the middle. Make sure you can still click the campfire under the alchemy table and the chest that's just under that. Otherwise, just move the chest around a little bit. 
This is the most forgiving part of the build, so don't rush to dismantle everything if it's not perfect. The absolute worst case scenario is you might not be able to click one of the boxes, but you'll still have plenty of storage for a solo player. Once all your boxes are down and you've made sure that nothing is blocked, just take a second to make sure you can click everything because this is basically it. Once the bedroll is down, you won't be able to place anything else. Run down the list of benches, make sure you can move easily. You can also optionally place a standing torch of your choice in the corner by the door, and if everything checks out, place a hide bedroll on the two chests we raised earlier. You can see now that if these were flush with the ground, your bedroll would actually collide with the bucket of the tanner's bench, which is why we raised them. As a final step, pull your bracelet to make sure you can spawn in the base without getting stuck, and if you can, you're all set. And there you have it. The most gorgeous 2x2 stack in Conan Exiles. We used just about every technique we had. Plate offsets, chests as floors, incense support, variable flooring, foundation offsets, and intimate knowledge of bench hit boxes to make everything fit. Hopefully walking you through it made these concepts a bit easier to understand and see how they can be useful in real base building. I still wouldn't recommend purely living out of a 2x2, a temporary structure elsewhere for your precision fireballs and better alchemy benches because please don't craft the expensive potions of the default bench we have, is still more or less necessary. You can thank the economy update for that. But this is the closest you can get to a viable tiny base using everything I know. So for those of us that are stubborn and want to at least pretend we're playing the game normally, this is our best bet. The only two tricks we didn't use were wedge ceilings and door frame placement, but I think those are pretty self-explanatory, so I trust you'll find ways to make those work for you. With that, we're nearly finished. But with every build guide I make, I try to throw in some freaky shit, just to keep things spicy, and this video is no exception. I've actually been squatting on this idea for a long time now, since I'm still not convinced on how viable it is, but now that we can squeeze bases into tinier spaces than ever before, I think it's time we started tackling an age-old problem. Conan's land claim system is the bane of every solo player trying to hide. Players can run around using a foundation as a radar essentially, and if it shows land is claimed, they'll know there's a base nearby. The amount of land claim that even a tiny base projects makes it extremely hard to stay hidden for long. But what if I told you it was possible to build a base that couldn't be found this way? It's actually a very simple idea. Placeables do not claim land. So why not place my benches directly on the ground and then box them in with decorations? You can extend the decay timer of placeables the same way you do with chests, just build a bunch of stuff nearby and break it. So besides the way it looks, it's functionally identical to any other base. It'll only take one bomb to open, but any hidden solo base is a cheap raid even if you build it out of tier 3. And what's really the difference between 2 bombs and 20 bombs when the harvest rate is 4x? When you think of how lazy the average scouting run has become with foundation sweeping, you could potentially hide for weeks in a well-placed bug out shelter, making this a more than worthwhile trade-off. Naturally, it's not easy to place all the benches that you want under the tents, but that's where the bench stacking comes into play. The better you are at that, the more you can get out of this, and eventually you'll have an entire base hidden in the hills somewhere that nobody will find. Imagine how hard it'll be to smoke out a solo rat using something like this. And in case you don't believe me on the land claim, my beautiful assistant Kronk, who is just me but on my laptop, will demonstrate. Despite not being in my clan, he can place a foundation right next to my stuff, with no this land is already claimed message or a warning. You'll notice he can actually place the foundation too. It doesn't disappear as if you had placed it under certain illegal bases, meaning it's actually completely indetectable unless you actually look at it. Of course, this also means that if somebody finds it, they can just build it in since there's no land claim, but hidden bases are always high risk, high reward. So just keep a bedroll inside to get in there and get your stuff out. I'm still not sure how viable I'd consider this. It's admittedly a little bit goofy, but I think it's a fun idea. I'm looking forward to experimenting with it further and seeing what you guys come up with. I've already found a number of hiding locations where this is actually completely viable with the full setup and everything, so let me know if any of you guys try this. But with that, we're finally done. Hopefully after all that, you can walk away from this with a few new tricks up your sleeve. And if you made it all the way to the end, thanks for watching.